We need to IND from the track. <laughs> um, so in terms of our objectives today, we're going to review the risk factors for and the science of human trafficking, identify how to respond and to support the health and safety of the needs of survivors of human trafficking, and describe ways that we as health professionals can interrupt this cycle of exploitation, which is all too common. Um, first, a few myths. Sometimes people think, oh, this is an issue that only happens in the developing world or it only impacts foreign nationals, but um, people who are domestically born and raised are impacted as well as foreign born. Um, there's both labor trafficking, where people are exploited for their work, and sex trafficking. This talk will focus a little bit more on sex trafficking because we see a lot of it in the teen clinic. And I'm sure that um, as ED and PICU staff, you guys have also um, seen lots of patients impacted by human trafficking, whether we recognize it or not. Um, so in terms of kind of basic definitions, sometimes people confuse human smuggling, which is crossing the borders without papers, and human trafficking. Traffic kind of sounds like transportation or traffic, but basically um, the quick definition is slavery. The long definition is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, of, or provision of a person through force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of involuntary servitude, slavery, or a commercial sex act. And a commercial sex act is basically when any kind of sexual service is traded for anything of value. So sometimes we have patients who don't have a good place to stay and they're couch surfing and in exchange for being on somebody's couch, they're having sex with somebody they're not excited about. That is a form of commercial sex. Um, so this is the um, federal definition from the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000. When we are talking about a minor, you don't need to prove in a court of law that there was any specific force, fraud, or court. And minors cannot consent to commercial sex. Um, like I mentioned, um, there can be all kinds of sexual exploitation, whether it be images of a child um, used in a commercial manner or, um, you know, basically anything listed on this feed. And this is a clip from GEMS, a New York based organization that fights um, human trafficking. I'm going to share this clip because it frames the issue pretty well. When I first started, I was 13. Dad was 14. I was only 12 years old. At the time, he was like, what, 29, 30? We're going to find a little hole today, you know what I'm saying? Put on that curl and make that edge, you understand that? So where you're heading to and all that? I want to talk to you more, you know what I'm saying? You got a nice little thing going on, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, yo. You look such a sweet talker. Love you. This has been four years of her life from 12 to 16. He's 35. He's basically raised her. If you prepare to stay and have it get, stay the same and get worse, then you need to understand that's what it is, but it will not get better. You deserve to just have a regular life. You deserve to go back to school and get a job and work in a pet store and do all the things that you want to do. But those have to be your choices, sweetie. I can't make those choices for you. In any other situation, she would be too young to consent to sex. To have her charged on prostitution charges is a little absurd. She's treated like a criminal. After all the stuff that happened to her, instead of them taking her to the hospital, they took her to the jailhouse. I think it's one of the most despicable things a person anybody can do. You're my mother. You don't have anything to do. Okay, so just a few comments on this. Um, Clip. I have been working in the teen clinic in our school-based health centers for about 11 years, and when I um, first started seeing this issue, because of the stigma and the shame, patients never present saying, like, oh, I'm a victim of human trafficking. But interestingly, on the vaccine record, I could see um, where they'd gotten their shots. And if they'd gotten their shots at the juvenile justice center and they were a young woman presenting to care, 
more times than not, the reason they'd been incarcerated was having been a victim of uh, sexual exploitation. Um, there have been some recent changes in the law, so our current response to minors experiencing commercial sex well, exploitation is not to incarcerate them, not a perfect system, but there have been some small changes. And I, I would say that language and how we respond um, to the situation can definitely influence how patients feel. And so um, the term teen prostitution can carry some of the, the stigma and shame. Oftentimes when people think of a prostitute, you think of somebody who um, has moral feelings or who has made a decision. Um, kids starting in this at the ages of 11 and 12, they're not making a choice. They have not, uh, you know, and I'm not saying that um, older people engage in sex work. You know, oftentimes if there's a lack of options, people do what they have to do. Um, and you see language misuse throughout the media with the recent um, Jeffrey Epstein in the news with that going down. There was many articles that talked about underage women. That's a child. Why call them an underage woman? Um, so you'll sometimes hear the term CSEC, that's commercial sexually exploited child. I often use the term CSE because I think that our patients who are 18, 19, and 20, et cetera, they've been experiencing this for years. And I don't think just because somebody's turned 18, they don't need our help and support. Um, so luckily, as of January 2017, Senate Bill 1322, we no longer criminalize um, youth who are experiencing this problem. Uh, for 18 and above, we still do but um, there's many countries around the world who have started to decriminalize those who are selling sex and instead hold responsible those who are profiting from this crime. And it is extremely profitable. Um, unlike trafficking in drugs or in weapons where you sell your goods and you're out, a child can be sold over and over and over again, which is obviously very traumatic for their health and well-being. We don't have perfect data about how many kids are impacted. The estimates are that somewhere between 100,000 and 300,000 kids in the United States are at risk for sexual exploitation. I remember um, when I first started working on this topic, Nancy O'Malley, the district attorney, wanted to partner with us to apply for a grant to support survivors of sex trafficking. And I thought, oh, we have Epic, a state-of-the-art electronic health record. This will be easy for us to query you know, how many patients we serve, just put in the ICD-10 code, only to find out there is no ICD-10 code for this issue, and oftentimes it's not um, recognized. Of you guys who have been working here at Children's, how many of you think you have encountered a patient that's been impacted by human trafficking? Is there anybody who doesn't have a <laughs> um, Yeah, so this is prevalent. I think um, I've started sort of tracking in teen clinic how many patients I see, and I'm only in clinic three days a week. The rest is project time, and I follow at least 120 kids who are experiencing this. So um, all kinds of youth can be impacted. Some of the risk factors are a history of abuse or neglect. Sexual abuse is especially predictive of future vulnerability. Um, homeless or runaway youth, um, like I mentioned, price of housing is crazy these days. And if you don't have a safe place to live, you're more vulnerable. Um, poverty, hunger, there's a recent sad case from our partners in San Francisco where there was a family that was going to be facing eviction. They had a bunch of kids and the landlord and the mom made a deal that if the landlord could start sleeping with a 14 year old, they could stay. And uh, they noticed that the child was not showing up at school, that she was showing up with trauma and that's why. Um, Abuse or neglect can lead to system involvement. That is a risk. Youth of color are disproportionately impacted by this problem here in Oakland, and the FBI has designated um, the Bay Area as like a hotspot of child sexual exploitation, and um, so not a distinction that we want to have. Um, queer youth are also at risk, especially if they end up being thrown out of their home and are not getting support. Um, this is um, one of my former patients who's an amazing, um, eloquent advocate, and she has spent time in our ED. I think she's been an inpatient, not in the picture as far as I recall, but um, she's going to share a little bit of her story. Forward it. Um, I was 10 years old. I was in the foster care system. I had just been through so much in my life. Um, 
like I said, back and forth within my biological family with the foster care system, growing up in foster homes where I'm being abused and neglected, both physically, sexually, um, definitely verbally and mentally, you know, being made to feel like I wasn't anything, being told that I was nothing but a paycheck, you know, my whole life being controlled by other people and moving from home to home to home. So when I met a man when I was 10 years old, who promised me that he was going to love me unconditionally. He was going to have my back and he was going to take care of me. And he was going to, you know, give me the nice things. And, you know, just, I mean, let's just be real. As a, as a young girl, that's just something that was just so like, ah. um, but specifically in that age, you know, at 10 years old, I was a child. I didn't really know much as far as about life, except for what I, had already experienced, which was rough. So having this man tell me, oh, I'm gonna take care of you, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna be constant. That's the biggest word that I wanna say is constant. Um, that was that was really what was important. So, so let me pause on my story because there's an important um, factor that I wanna bring you guys back to. Has anybody, and please raise your hand, have you ever wanted someone to notice you? Please raise your hand. All right. And have you ever succumbed to peer pressure? Please raise your hand. Have you ever trusted someone you shouldn't have? And have you ever wanted to be a part of something? Raise your hands. Have you ever needed help but didn't know where to go? And lastly, have you ever been taken advantage of? That's what was going on for me. So a lot of people ask, well, oh, is it have to be a certain type of young individual that is vulnerable for human trafficking? Is it, you know, that they have to come from a certain place? Or those basic questions make everyone in this room vulnerable for human trafficking. So these were all questions that I was going through at the time, and and well, well issues that I were going was going through at the time. And so I met this man, he promised me forever. Little did I know that forever meant that I had to sell my body every day to make at least a thousand dollars and two hundred dollars of that had to go on drugs every day so if I didn't do it I'm gonna be beat to a pulp I'm all messed up and don't nobody care the first three years I was being trafficked now mind you I started right here in Oakland on international on 21st in some in a white wife beater some blue jean shorts and some pink converses I had no body people knew I was young but that meant a higher price that more, meant more profit and more money for the person who was exploiting me. And so just, you know, understanding that I was just in such a vulnerable place. Um, and um, yes, we also see this on the internet, which has become a venue for people to look for um, sexual services. Um, so some of the online forums, for example, Backpage, was actually helping posters refine keywords with terms like petite, new in town, or other keywords so people can search for children. Um, there's a Netflix documentary called I Am Jane Doe. I don't know if any of you guys have <coughs> seen it, but it chronicles the efforts of some families to hold Backpage accountable uh, for their complicit and money-making um, when it comes to CSEC, and um, they actually eventually were shut down but it pops up in other places. Um, so this is a snapshot of some of the data from Alameda County, just kind of highlighting risk factors and um, some of the health issues that youth experiencing CSEC go through. Okay, last video clip. You know, you're 12 years old and you're living with your moms and your mom's is struggling because she didn't think that life was really going to work out like this for her and she doesn't have a man around and the men that are around haven't always been that great. Sexual abuse is becoming kind of normal for you and you think that other people don't have secrets that are as bad as you and maybe you've tried to talk to somebody at school and they haven't really heard you or maybe they just haven't had time to listen to you. And so...
you're seeing these girls on, on the videos and they're so pretty and they're so sexy and, and so your way at 12 of escaping into this fantasy world is to think about what it must be like to be one of these girls and you know that adult men already look at you and you wonder how you can kind of use that. I was just a child, you know, so I was supposed to live like a child, like an adult. So one day you're coming out of school and there's a guy outside in a Cadillac and he's he's nice looking. I mean, he's he's got the baseball cap and the jeans and the Tims and he tells you how pretty you are and you know how pretty your hair looks and it's been a while since anybody even really noticed anything about you. And for the first time, you feel like somebody's really interested in you because now all of a sudden he's asking you about your dreams and your hopes and where your father's at. And he says that he can be a daddy to you. The people that I shouldn't have depend on, I was depending on for support, for support, for support. And so that night he takes you to a club and he puts you up on the stage and he gives you a few drinks and there's men throwing dollars at you and it's scary but all the time you're just looking at his face in the back of the room and he's like you know go ahead baby girl go ahead you're doing it for daddy and you're feeling proud because nobody's ever said that to you and so then that night he tells you that there's more stuff that you've got to do and he takes you into a room and there's a man there and he tells you to strip and you think this is something you'll never do and yet there's a part of you that already knew how to do this because that's what your stepfather's been doing to you all these years before and so you turn that trick and it's like a part of you has died inside and so you come out of the club that night and you get in the car and you know he's pumping 50 cent and he takes you to mcdonald's and he tells you you did a good job tonight sweetie and he's stuffing his pockets with the thousand dollars that he made and right now you're happy the people that i shouldn't have depend on <coughs> okay so she just kind of highlights again risk factors and that um, there's a lot of money that's involved so people are motivated to sell children um, in terms of recruitment, there can be um, different styles. The most common form of recruitment is somebody posing as a romantic partner and grooming somebody, showering them with gifts and love and attention. And, um, you know, then there's a shift. There's something you've got to do for us. Um, every now and then it can be a kidnapping situation, um, especially when it's an international um, situations sometimes false advertising about a job opportunity whether it be modeling acting or dancing um, sometimes there can be peer recruitment where there's somebody who's already being exploited by an individual and they have that person reach out to others um, and then again internet you never know who is on the other side of a chat room um, so making sure that you know how to use screen safely and with supervision um, another sad thing that we see is um, in family human trafficking. Um, Min Ping is a local survivor and amazing advocate who grew up here in Silicon Valley. She was a straight A student, sang in the choir, played soccer, and um, her dad was exploiting her. Um, and again, um, exploiters and risk factors. This is a clip from a wire trap that happened right here in the East Bay. Um, an exploiter who is um, planning with um, associates to recruit somebody who's struggling, who's working at Walmart, and they're planning on um, recruiting her, getting in, getting her involved. And this is a look at his home in Danville, living in a quote unquote respectable neighborhood. So this is going on in every neighborhood with every type of youth. And um, in terms of mechanisms of control, some of them are obvious, physical violence, so they may show up in the ED or the PICU with an injury related to having experienced violence. Um, emotional violence kind of on the spectrum of domestic violence with alternating acts of kindness and then um, violence. We see a lot of sexual violence in the teen clinic, whether it be sexual assault or just reproductive coercion. 
um, intimidation threats to people's family members, saying, um, if you tell what's going on, we know where your mom lives, we know where your sister lives, etc. cetera. Um, economic dependence, making sure that somebody doesn't have their own money or identification, and then restricted and monitored movements. Oftentimes, um, in teen clinic, we try to do part of the visit one-on-one, -on -one, and you'll see situations where somebody is FaceTiming with an individual who doesn't need to be there. So you can see all kinds of monitoring that's going on. Um, there was a case that popped up in an ED on the East Coast where a patient was saying like, oh, I have a tracker in me, kind of like one of those pet trackers. And initially the ED team was like, hey, time to call psych, only to find that she had implanted in her a tracker that's usually used in pets. So sometimes uh, listening to patients um, can be a good strategy. <laughs> I think the most insidious thing that we see are trauma bonds, which means that many patients don't see themselves as a victim. And so a trauma bond is when you form a deep connection between a victim of abuse and their abuser. On one hand, you can understand it's kind of a survival adaptation. Like if somebody's going to kill you or you play along with them and act like, yes, this is my new family. Um, you know, you see it in all kinds of settings, the, the term Stockholm syndrome came up when a bank robber held a group of people hostage in a bank in Sweden and pretty soon the people were going along with the bank robber and it's kind of a just an adaptive response to extreme stress and we see that a lot with our patients and that's why nobody's going to present saying like I'm a victim of human trafficking oftentimes even if there's a lot of signs of what's going on a lot of youth will say like this is what I've chosen and this is what I want so um Kind of having a trauma-informed response in terms of thinking, you know, what's going on, what traumas are causing you to act in the way you are acting rather than what's wrong with you or sometimes dismissing people as uh, stressed healthcare providers can do if they're busy and not sure how to respond anyway. Okay, and then in some large studies, um, 60 to 80 percent of survivors of human trafficking have interfaced with healthcare providers. So appreciate your time being here because we will see these kids and we will have an opportunity to offer support and to intervene. In terms of barriers that we see, sometimes if people don't know what signs to look for or are feeling rushed and have 20 patients waiting and know that this is going to really back us up, or if people feel like, you know, there are no community referrals or supports that are going to be helpful that can be a barrier and then also like i was mentioning just bias or judgmental attitudes like you know what's the point it's going to happen again next week so why would i bother which um kids deserve better and then in terms of barriers to healthcare, people who are experiencing um human trafficking often have restricted movement restricted um health insurance fear of mandated reports and especially in this day and age of immigration scrutiny if somebody's undocumented that can be a big barrier and then what I've heard repeatedly from survivor thriver advocates that I work with just the judgment and shame and the vibes that they've gotten in healthcare settings can make them not want to come back um, we've seen this in action lately we had a patient at our East Oakland school-based health center who sadly had to give a diagnosis of HIV too, and oftentimes we'll set up follow up at downtown youth clinic that does wonderful wraparound services for somebody um, with a recent diagnosis of HIV, and the young woman did not show up, did not show up, was not showing up to care, and it turns out um, was a victim of human trafficking. Her exploiter didn't want her to engage with the HIV clinic. Um, okay. Just a quick case, you're working in the ED, a 16-year-old young woman comes in for a dental abscess. Um, the intern takes a detailed psychosocial history and finds out that since your patient left her last group home, she's been couch surfing and has been engaging in survival sex. Um, the team should A, make a mandated report, B, no need to report, or C, phone a friend. <laughs> yeah, so I would say A and C, C being called the social worker. And then, um, yes, anybody who is a minor who's engaging in any form of um, commercial sex does need a mandated report. And um, will she actually say, I mean, will the 
child, 16 year old, actually say I'm involved in survival sex? Um, That's what I'm, I mean. It depends on the patient. Um, right. Sometimes you'll get a story of, you know, I'm staying at so and so's house and he is 35, and yes, we're having sex, and do I like him? No. Um, that kind of a story. There are other times when kids are surprisingly open. Um, and it is very important to explain the ground rules of confidentiality before anybody from the team takes the detailed psychosocial history. Um, you know, the other day in teen clinic, we had a 17 year old transgender patient who was kind of openly and proudly telling the team that he was involved in sex work. And um, it was challenging to then have to make a mandated report. And he was saying, well, if you make the mandated report, my parents are going to cut me off of their health insurance and that's going to have these negative impacts for me. Um, and so just making sure that if you do have to make a report or the social worker has to make a report, trying to do that in a way that's going to be minimally traumatic for the patient and have them be an active participant and let them know that your goal is to, for them to be safe and healthy and that you're trying to mobilize support and resources for them. There'll be other times when they don't tell you anything that you're just seeing a lot of indicators and we'll go over which indicators to look for. And um, it is appropriate to make a report even if the child says, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, but you're seeing signs and you're worried. And the only way we can make a report from the ICU is through the social worker and the doctor? Um, your ICU team would tell you better. My understanding is anybody can make a report. I think it's time consuming, so I like it when the social work friends will do it for me. Um, when you say a report, though, I mean a report that is written to, I mean, like, like can we CPS, just- Like CPS, child welfare report, same okay. thing for any instance of neglect or abuse. Okay. That same kind of a CPS report. Yeah. And it has been a change. Prior to 2017, it was law enforcement send them off to JJC. But as of 2017, just like any other kind of abuse or neglect, if their health is in danger, CPS report. When you make the report, then are they tr are they treated? Are they seen, or is it just a report to that they're suspicious? What happens once the report is made? The child welfare team will do an evaluation, um, depending on the circumstances. They have protocols about within what amount of time they'll do an evaluation. Um, my experience has been for a lot of patients, it's not like they're rushing out in the moment. There are some agencies that will do bedside advocacy. Um, so for example, at Highland, they have a wonderful group that um, is part of their sexual abuse response team that also does response to human trafficking. So they will do kind of a warm handoff intervention. Um, SHADE, which is a local organization founded by survivors, just got a big grant from the Department of Justice, and we're hoping that as of January of 2020, um, if people want them to show up in the ED and meet with the patient, that they can. But our social work team and the Center for Child Protection um, have a lot of experience in offering support as well. So I think we do have resources we can turn to. Okay, and then just a little reminder that um, Youth experiencing sexual exploitation have a lot of women's health needs. There are certainly men and boys who are exploited, but um, people should have on their radar that um, making sure there's not a need for emergency contraception. This is a, a little update and review. Everybody's heard about Plan B, the over-the-counter morning after pill. There's a newer version of emergency contraception called Ella, which our hospital does carry. Um, it has full efficacy for up to five days after unprotected sex. Um, and our IUDs can also be used as emergency contraception. We do have those available in our teen clinic. Okay, so the bottom line is that identification of human trafficking is challenging. It's often missed. Um, we're in the process of developing evidence-based screening tools, but unlike other medical conditions where you can just ask the patient, are you experiencing X, Y, Z? Um, in this situation, it's kind of looking for the various indicators. And um, with any adolescent patient, doing a HEADS assessment, a psychosocial screen, is a great first step towards finding out if everything is going great or if there is need for further assessment. So I would say that um, if there's two or more things that are a little bit 
not as you would want it to be on the HEADS assessment, then that would be a time to pull out um, a more thorough assessment. And one of the ones that I'll show you about later in this talk is called the SEIT, which stands for Commercial Sexual Exploitation Identification Tool. And it has um, a list of the indicators to look for in a scoring system. And um, so we'll highlight that later in the talk. I'm curious in, for example, the ED, typically would you guys say it's the resident who does the HEADS assessment or who, yeah, okay. So then um, some of the indicators that would make you worried if their housing is unstable, if they have run away from their group home, or if they are homeless, if there is a history of trauma or abuse. Um, and I would say that could be both um, psychological trauma or physical trauma. Like a lot of my patients who are survivors have had gunshot wounds or have been in motor vehicle accidents. So um, the kinds of traumas that you guys see both in the ED and PQ can often go along with being involved in risk risky situations. Um, relationships that are concerning and or age inappropriate. Um, the average person accompanying a patient into the ED when asked to step aside usually will, um, but if there's somebody who is not willing to give the patient some space, that could be a sign that there's something amiss. And um, sometimes we have to be crafty in terms of taking people to radiology or other places where you're going to get a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time to touch base. Um, one thing which I guess would be hard to identify in the ED or the PICU, but in a primary care setting, if you fall at a patient and they haven't had a lot of resources and then suddenly they're popping up carrying three different iPhones and, you know, which team needs to have many gadgets, that can be a sign that they are working for somebody and being exploited. Um, and then sometimes you can see the content on somebody's cell phone and if it seems inappropriate or, um, you know, very sexually explicit, may be a sign that there's something going on, or it may just be that they're a modern team. Um, some clinics have tried to screen for sexual exploitation directly using phrases like these, but I do find that um, more often than not, it's looking for the indicators. Um, if you are gonna ask directly, kind of framing it such that a patient can chime in on behalf of themselves or a friend in case they want to gather information but they don't want you to be making a CPS report on them in the moment. or And also just framing it that we're worried about their health and safety and that's why we're asking, not that we're trying to get all up in their business. Um, if you do find out that there's something going on, all members of the team should be judicious in terms of the information we gather and only get what we need that's medically relevant. Um, the Center for Child Protection or whoever is doing a forensic exam or report can ask the nitty gritty. So we don't want to re-traumatize patients by asking more than is necessary. And um, being aware that this can be triggering for people and that physical exams can be triggering. So if there's somebody who's having a disproportionately hard time with something like a pelvic exam, it may be that they've experienced trauma. All right. And so in terms of presenting issues that we'll see, trauma or assault-related conditions, exacerbations of chronic medical conditions. We have a few patients impacted by human trafficking that have diabetes and often are presenting in DKA, et cetera, because they're not in a situation to prioritize health maintenance. Um, so when you see a clinical situation where the average family would have come in much sooner, that can be a sign that there's something going on. Uh, reproductive health issues, frequent sexual transmitted infections, pelvic inflammatory disease, um, frequent pregnancy tests or positive pregnancies um, can be an indicator, and then behavioral health crises. So people presenting with suicidal ideation or with complications of substance use or alcohol. And again, I would say um, listening to patients. We had a patient here a few years ago who was only 13 years old and had a 5150. And um, the behavioral health team had charted some of her quote unquote psychotic ramblings where she was talking about wanting to jump off a bridge because there was a quota and her friend was <coughs> expecting her to bring in XYZ dollars. And it was all charted as if it was kind of just like a, a breakdown, when lo and behold, this was her reality. 
So kind of making sure that we, we do hear our patients and follow up appropriately. Um, not surprisingly, if somebody's going through a lot of trauma, that can have impact on mood. So people experiencing human trafficking often may have depression, anxiety, panic attacks. I think this one's an important one to discuss, the anger aggressiveness. Sometimes somebody who's traumatized will not behave the way we would want them to behave in a clinical setting. And so if somebody is losing it and is needing security to be there, et cetera, it may be that there's some serious trauma going on and trying to be a safe place and have an open door policy. So if it turns out somebody has stormed out AMA today, just making sure that they feel welcome back for next time, even if they're not behaving in a way that we would want them to. Does that make sense? What I'm saying, I think like the average outpatient setting is a little bit relieved when a patient kind of leaves and storms off and they're kind of hoping, oh, I hope they never come back. But those are the patients often most in need of our help. Um, and then drug and alcohol issues, many exploiters intentionally get their um, workers hooked on drugs or alcohol because it's easier to manipulate somebody who is addicted. So keeping that on our radar. If the history is kind of scripted or memorized or seems inconsistent, then that can be an indicator. A few years ago, one of my patients who spent time on the inpatient side and was an 11 year old who had severe genital herpes to the point that she couldn't walk. Um, I think she was on the floor, not in the, the PICU, but you know, she had this story that made no sense about being on a ferry and her friend who's kind of her boyfriend had a bump on his finger and she can't remember his name, but he, you know, just something that made absolutely no sense, but was being told to the healthcare team. And then lo and behold, with time, the true story came out. Um, sometimes patients experiencing human trafficking are coached by their exploiter to lie about their age and claim that they're older than they are. And we already spoke about the accompanying person. On physical exam, if somebody is dressed incongruously for the weather, if it's freezing out and somebody's wearing very little clothes, um, there can be tattoos or branding that make you worry about human trafficking. So the average teen is usually kind of proud of tattoos and happy to discuss them. But if there's a situation where patients seem embarrassed of their tattoos or if there's tattoos that kind of indicate money or property of, etc. cetera, that, that can sometimes be a sign. All right. And um, yes, the, the health effects are very real. I would say of all the patients that I've had to diagnose with HIV during my years here, all of them, both male and female, had experienced sexual exploitation. And you can see high rates of unintended pregnancies. And there's some exploiters who intentionally will have children with their um, the people they exploit as another mode of control and coercion. Um, I don't know if these guys recovered. Okay, so again, just taking a trauma-informed approach, kind of asking what happened to you, not what's wrong with you, and trying to make sure that everybody is non-judgmental and that the goal <coughs> is health and safety. Um, responding with empathy and highlighting strengths and resiliency. I would say a lot of the patients that I've dealt with who have experienced human trafficking are amazingly strong and amazingly um, resilient. Okay, and I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, exploiters are taking full advantage of technology to further their profits. And one question that we started asking here at Children's is how can we leverage technology and the electronic health record to fight human trafficking? And when I first started doing this work, there were no ICD-10 codes related to human trafficking. Um, in the past year, they've come out, but they are a little bit problematic in terms of not every patient um, wants it all over their health record that they're a victim of human trafficking, especially if they've moved on to being a survivor. And so we've been developing something that we're calling the EPIC Safety Net Tool here at Children's, which um, has a confidential area to document somebody's status. And it has a built-in assessment tool that I'll show you 
we were able to work with local organizations that offer support to trafficked individuals to streamline the referrals such that you can fill out one referral and fax it to three different agencies to mobilize mental health support, getting a case manager or a mentorship. And then I would like to hear from you guys um, if there's a patient that's been previously identified by teen clinic or by the juvenile justice center or some other group to be a victim of human trafficking, if you guys would find it most helpful to have an FYI flag that says something like safety net or to have a best practice advisory banner that pops up. So um, I'm going to show you a little overview and then we're going to hopefully have a little discussion about how you would want a heads up that your patient may have some special needs around this. So um, in terms of the tool that we're developing, there will be um, a section where you can select whether you know the patient has disclosed a history of commercial sexual exploitation, if you found it on chart review, or if you're just suspecting it. So it kind of breaks it down by what their status is. Um, in terms of the, the see it tool, it has eight areas um, that are basically a summary of what we've just talked about. So housing and caregiving, um, if there's vulnerabilities such as homelessness or foster care or that they are no longer um, with their placement, um, you can give it a score of no concern, possible concern, or clear concern. Um, and so basically it summarizes all the indicators that we talked about and lets you um, give it a score. And um, based on that, you can um, know how to respond. And I will pass around our um, response protocol. In fact, I guess I'll just start sending that around so you can take a look at it. Where would it be in the chart? So I would love to hear from you guys where we should hang these. Um, we will be trying to make them available on Chonet, and I'm happy to make these slides available. So if you want to have your own personal copy. Um, was, did I understand your question right? Where would you chart it on? Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so um, in terms of accessing this um, tool, it's being built as a smart form. So um, I actually would love it if there's somebody in the audience who's interested in this topic to kind of work with me to figure out where to put the special navigator for your workflow so that it's easily accessible. Um, in our outpatient setting, under this tab, there's a special navigator and then you can pull up safety net. Um, and the hope is to have it pop up a little banner, possibly the FYI flag. Um, I know that this screen is probably more of an outpatient screen than an ED or PICU screen, but I think that most of us have a little more area. And I think when you click into more, there'll be a special navigator and safety net, which you can put a little star and have it stay on your sidebar if you want it. Yeah. Uh, oh, I wasn't sure. Okay. okay, so in the ICU, we have a lot, I have a lot of bars on the side. And I wouldn't click on chart review unless I needed something that I knew was in chart review and is specific to it. So if you wanted the BPA to pop up, maybe have it pop up initially when you assign yourself, um, like you would a sepsis, um, you know, a pop up that, you know, oh, according to these vitals, but maybe have it pop up initially and then we can click already treating or aware or maybe have a little flag down by the chart review if that's even possible. I'm not, I'm not very aware of Epic and how they, you know, format things, but uh, I know how to use it, but I know, I don't know how to structure it. Um, so I would not, as an ICU nurse, go to chart review or more unless I was specifically looking for something. And to be honest, sometimes it's so busy that, you know, unless there was some type of suspicion, you know, with a verbal patient in the ICU, um, then that's when I would, I might look at it. But if you wanted more of a heads up, I would say have something more visual that we can click on, like a flag. Uh, who is responsible for filling out, the, like answering the questions for the risk assessment? 
So the hope <coughs> is that the social worker, the intern, the primary care provider, the mental health provider, I think anybody who wants to could, but the idea is not that you guys would be burdened with it because I know there's already a lot going on. But if we would like you to be able to see the information, or if you happen to be the first one to want to cover it, to say, like, hey, intern, are these social worker, can you update this? Yeah, because technically, like, you would have to write a report if you started charging those things, right? Yeah, and so if it turns out you were the first one to zoom in on this issue, you would ideally want to get social work involved, have them do the mandated report, and then ideally fill out this tool. Um, so, yeah. Uh, well, I just work in the emergency department, and I would really love to collaborate with you on that. Yeah, I think a lot of the adolescents that we see are coming in for, like, <coughs> STI stuff, and I just feel like the population we see in our emergency department, that would be really great to, like, kind of um, figure out how that would work best for our department. Awesome. So I'll the talk exciting you. thing is the Presence Innovation Fund gave us yeah, like some pilot funding to work on this, and so we actually have some funds for people to be consultants to help on it. Yeah. So I'm glad that you're spontaneously interested. But if anybody else would want to collaborate, um, there is a little bit of funds for protected time to do a little bit of work and kind of getting those who are not able to be here today on board and figuring out what's going to help the workflow and help patients and not be some like interruption to the workflows. Um, so this is an example of how the best practice advisory banner might pop up for um, the health team. So kind of just if a patient's been previously identified, let's say they're my primary care patient, I put an alert on them and they roll into the ED, that it would pop up for the resident just reminding them, might want to have social work, do a safety check, might want to assess their, their women's health needs. We did have a sad case in the past year where a patient um, got hit by a car on International Boulevard at 2 in the morning, came in with an ankle fracture, which the orthopedic team beautifully set and took care of her broken bone and sent her out. And nobody stopped to ask, why was a youth on International Boulevard at 2 in the morning? What were they doing out there? And if there had been a little further assessment, we probably would have wanted to give her post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. We would have wanted to give her morning after pill. So it was a missed opportunity. The hope is that once we've really developed this EPIC tool, it would kind of be on autopilot, but yeah. Um, just because, like, when we have kids in the ICU that get, you know, a CPS report done, we don't usually see it through. Like, they eventually get transferred to another floor, and yeah. then it's done. Like, so what, is, what does the whole report look like? Like, you said you have your 11-year-old patient with herpes. Like, how is she discharged? Like, how does it end? Well, that particular patient kind of, I feel like a little bit of a sad story, that the inpatient team did make a CPS report the first time they went out. The CPS worker said to them, oh, they wouldn't open the door. So we, we didn't do anything. And then I was following that kid in the outpatient setting, and that child had never been in school. Like I mentioned, had that complication. And so our outpatient social worker and I worked together to get CPS manager involved to reassess until something happened and she was placed with her grandma. Now she can read and is doing great. Wow. Um, so these kids have potential. Um, okay, so I passed around our human trafficking response protocol. It talks about screening and then response. In terms of the no concern arm, I think that's a little bit more for the outpatient setting in terms of universal education about healthy relationships and respect because this is kind of all on a spectrum. You know, we see other situations where it's not as dire as human trafficking, but um, situations where people are not being treated with the respect and kindness they deserve in a relationship. Um, if there's some concern, you're a little bit worried, but there's nothing obvious that makes you feel like a CPS report is indicated. Um, offering social work support about whatever unmet, unmet needs there may be or addressing whatever mental health situations are going on so that hopefully the youth will not be vulnerable for human trafficking. Um, if there's high concern for minors, it's relatively clear-cut in terms of the mandated report. In an ideal world, the mandated report would result in linkage to care to all the appropriate social services. And in San Francisco, that is kind of how it's working right now, whereas in the East Bay, it's a little bit more fragmented where 
the CPS report is a great idea, but I think they've been a little overwhelmed and don't have the most expeditious of responses. So I think it is great if our team can also refer to West Coast Children's Services that has a wonderful mental health program where they will travel within a 90 mile radius, meet the kiddo where they are to do supportive counseling and have experience with um, the specific trauma. And unlike the average therapy referral where if you make it, they'll reach out once. If they don't engage, they're like, whatever. But they reach out repeatedly over a three month span and will um, get them in and do some amazing work. Um, T, who I showed you the clip of my patient, um, worked with a wonderful therapist there and I think um, helped her get to where she is today. Um, this is the 24 hour human trafficking hotline. So if you're ever working in a place that doesn't have a well-developed human trafficking protocol, you can call them and they have a database of all the local resources <laughs> or providers can call them, text them. They have a nice website. So shout out to the National Human Trafficking Resource Center. And um, in our school-based health centers, we're working on some primary prevention. We're working on raising awareness. Um, there's some media campaigns. You've probably seen some of the billboards that um, Nancy O'Malley has spearheaded. And the hope is that with a coordinated response with all hands on deck, no child will be for sale. And I wanted to end with a happy note that our patient, T. Ortiz, um, has been honored as Glamour Magazine Woman of the Year. And here she is hobnobbing with Joe Biden, Jennifer Lopez, Ariana Huffington, and the Bush sisters. Keeltrafficking.org <laughs> um, oh. has some really wonderful resources. And um, if you're interested in joining this fight, feel free to drop me an email. We have a working group um, that meets about quarterly to deal with issues of human trafficking and would love to collaborate. so we can actually collect detailed data, but I would say maybe like 20% of the time. And sometimes it may be a situation of kind of generational trafficking where the parent had been impacted and then the kid's kind of getting involved and it's not so much that the parent is the actual trafficker, but that's just kind of the situation for the whole family. Um, but then other times we do see situations where the parent is complicit. Sometimes it's kind of more passively involved and other times more actively involved, but I would say approximately 20% of the time. I think 80% of the time it's more the, the, the boyfriend is the So what is the um, success of those who are confronted with maybe issues being trafficked of wanting to get support and help to get well and to change their situation? So um, again, I think there's not <coughs> super great data. I work with many survivor, thriver advocates who are doing amazing work, but in terms of like how many people end up moving on to other things and how many don't, I don't think anybody really knows the answer to that. I, I do think that it's a, like with any kind of a stages of change model, with most patients, it takes several <coughs> months and years of kind of contemplate, contemplating change. And I know in medicine, oftentimes we like to kind of cure people instantly and like, here's your antibiotic, now it's fixed, whatever. So I think just being mindful that in this particular situation, by offering support over time as someone moves from being pre-contemplative to um, ready for some change, that um, many people can move on to be healthy lives, but I don't think anybody really has the answer. That's partly why we're excited to be able to follow our cohort of patients so that we can see in the end, like how many um, are living healthy lives and how many people kind of become a sad statistic. I would think that a lot of them would probably not want to um, change their situation either because they can't or I, I don't know how much support you can give, but if they're in a situation where they don't have a place to live, they don't have family support, 
what then is done? Where would they go? Fostered or what can be done for them? Yeah, so for a minor, they are developing some supportive group homes. There's a new one called Claire's House, which is wraparound services for patients impacted by mm -hmm. commercial sexual exploitation. Depending on the youth, sometimes there may be an out of the area placement. Sometimes there will be a family member that can take them in in a different area and get them on a different track. So um, I think it's a fascinating question in terms of how often do kids end up doing well. But especially for minors, there are a lot of resources available. I think for the transitional age youth, that's when it becomes a little more tricky, especially if they were not systems involved when they were younger, then housing is tough. And um, But there are some resources through the Victims of Crime program. And a few of my patients have actually gotten retroactive pay for their years of exploitation that have helped set them up into their first apartment. Um, so getting them connected with the Family Justice Center and the advocates. There's also this wonderful program called MISI. It stands for Motivating, Inspiring, and Supporting Sexually Exploited Youth. Um, they have a lot of experience helping people um, get the support they need. So I'll pass around the flyers. If you want to keep them, you can, or if you just want to look at it when you're done, so you can leave them in the back and I'll collect them. Steph, I think what's happened um, a couple times in the ER when I've seen the same kids come in time after time and we suspect or, or know that they're being trafficked. Um, it's not much, but it seems like the best we can do is plant the seeds of hope and self-respect. And the, the one, I can think of two kids offhand. One was very young and like 10, 11 and very proud that she had a 19 year old boyfriend. Um, she was clearly, you know, but she was entered into the system because of her age, but the, the young teenagers, so they're embarrassed. They are, some of them can't look at themselves in the mirror. And some of them, you know, you just have to plant the seeds of hope and that we're here, our door's always open. When you're ready, hopefully it's soon, you know, um, I tell them, you know, you're a wonderful, lovable person. You deserve so much more. And someday you're going to be able to look in that mirror and say, I like that person. You know, you, you just have to kind of be your mom or your, your dad. You have to be your best person that you can with these kids to give them a little bit of, hey, somebody out there cares. Or maybe they'll come back to the ER remember that, oh, I had that nurse that was, that made me feel like I was not a piece of shit, you know. Or I had a nurse who, who helped me, or you know, I got some TLC. I think that's why a lot of our older teens still come to children, yes. even though they're too old. Yes. It's because they they know that we we give a shit, you know, they, they we care. And so the, the best I can do sometimes it doesn't seem like enough, and I want to give them services that they're not open for yet. But the best I can do is plant that seed of warmth and love and care. That's Oh, Lila Backrack. Yeah, I grew up in Oakland and I have a couple of friends that daughters got caught up in this um, sex trafficking about 11 or 12. And so there is places for these kids to go back, so they just need a